Here we go. Let's welcome again. Uh, my name is Dr. Deborah Krieger, she, her, and uh, it's my pleasure to um, bring this presentation to you on behalf of the Operationalizing Intersectionality Working Group, uh, the Alliance. Uh, it's especially a pleasure in these um, virtual times to welcome you um, to this, for better or for worse, very intimate um, area in my apartment. Um, so it's a pleasure to host you. I like to think of this as, um, you know, having you all over for tea and, and discussing this while sipping tea and everything. So that's kind of a nice uh, way for me to visualize this. And I hope that you'll feel welcome as well uh, to perhaps sip on some tea or some water and engage in the conversation. Um, you'll have to forgive me as well. I'm bouncing back and forth between letting folks in and presenting. So I, we'll, we'll keep going there. Right. So welcome to my apartment. Uh, it's also located in Toronto, Canada, uh, which I'd like to acknowledge has been the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, Seneca, and the Sasagas of Credit River for thousands of years, and is still home to many Indigenous people across Turtle Island, uh, from across Turtle Island today. And in going with today's themes, um, I'm grateful certainly to be working on these lands and to offer uh, this presentation from these lands, from this place. Um, but in learning from Indigenous leaders and scholars, activists, uh, that there's more to be done than just the acknowledgement of, of lands and peoples, uh, that we have to learn more and um, understand more about the histories of displacement and violence uh, of, that arrived us all here and where we are, uh, and also learning about the ongoing impacts of colonialism, excuse me, and colonization. Uh, and in line very much with today's themes, uh, something else that I've been encouraged uh, to do by, by learning from Indigenous leaders uh, is to think about how we can complement our words with actions. So how can we complement this idea of land acknowledgements with actions to intervene in the systems of oppression that are caused by colonization and the impacts thereof. Uh, so hopefully that, that has also um, whetted your appetite for what comes next. Uh, but before we get into the, today's presentation, I just wanna go over some Zoom etiquette uh, and some virtual etiquette just to clear up um, some things right off the bat. Uh, first is to uh, just remind everyone that we are recording this session and it will be available online uh, shortly. So in the next upcoming days, uh, so please engage uh, as you will. Uh, on that note, I've made it so that your microphone will be muted for the, dura for the duration of the presentation uh, and will be unmuted in discussion. So once we stop recording, once the presentation's over, uh, then we'll be able to chat with each other um, in person, <laughs> live, uh, <laughs> however you want to call that. Um, and also a note to please uh, keep your video off uh, to help with streaming. Um, so just everyone's tuning in from different places. I'm already sharing the PowerPoint, so please uh, do keep your video off for now. Um, I'll keep mine on so I can be a talking head on your screen. Uh, I've also disabled the chat box, you'll notice. Um, re regrettably, it's just me as a one-person show here today, <laughs> and so I'm going to try and not distract myself uh, until afterwards, but I do welcome your comments, so please uh, do take notes of them and questions as, as we go along. Uh, two other notes just on this virtual piece. Uh, the first is that if we for some reason get disconnected, I always joke that computers seem to have a sixth sense for sensing my presence and stop working. Uh, so if we do for any reason get disconnected, my apologies and please do rest assured that this will be recorded and posted online and we welcome uh, your comments and connection uh, via email. And the last note is that there is also a simultaneous French uh, webinar on this very topic happening at this very moment uh, from my colleague, Dr. Amélie kaiser Uh So I regret that the way things have worked out, that if you want to see the French one, um, it will be posted uh, after uh, online along with, excuse me, along with this English version. So uh, welcome to the English version and there will be a French one coming up for folks who wanted to see that there. All right. Okay. Uh, so today's agenda, we're going to be talking about E-Alliance's commitments, a little bit about what is intersectionality. I'll get into the Operationalizing Intersectionality Working Group at E-Alliance. Uh, and then the bulk of the presentation will be a walkthrough of our framework for operationalizing intersectionality. 
Uh, I'll go through a few of the uses and applications uh, briefly. Uh, and then, as I said, we'll turn off the recording and we can have a discussion uh, and Q&A question and answer about uh, any part of the presentation. So there's a lot of places that this story could start. And um, where I've chosen to start it today is with, excuse me, eAlliance's commitment to intersectional approaches. So, excuse me, on our website, you can find uh, seven key uh, commitments that eAlliance has uh, that have been part of forming eAlliance, part of the proposal, and have been there all along the way of um, creating this, uh, this enterprise. And the very first uh, commitment is to prioritizing an intersectional approach. So eAlliance is committed as per our website and as per our um, ideas to intersectional approaches uh, where we consider gender plus to be our terminology that recognizes that gender isn't an identity experienced on its own uh, and that in order to achieve gender equity in sport then we must understand individuals as wholes, uh, as embodied people with multiple and simultaneous identities. And as people who are facing uh, multiple overlapping systems of oppression. And when we talk about this, um, I also want to talk about backing up a moment. Where does this um, where does this commitment to intersectional approaches come from? And it comes from the idea of intersectionality, which was a concept uh, coined by Black feminist legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. And Professor Crenshaw, uh, again, a legal scholar, noticed through her examination of court cases that there were some patterns. And the pattern goes like this. So there are Black women plaintiffs who are alleging discrimination at their respective companies on the basis of sex and of race. And what would happen is these Black women plaintiffs would go to court and the cases would be wrongfully dismissed uh, because in the law, the uh, anti-discrimination doctrine viewed it as either sex or race. So the people presiding would say, well, at your company, there are, on the basis of sex, there are women, white women, who have been promoted, so you can't be being discriminated against on the basis of sex. And on the basis of race, there are Black people, Black men, who are also being promoted, so there's no way that you could be discriminated there. And you can see how that's a wrong argument that uh, these Black women were being discriminated against. And so Crenshaw noticed this and argued for the idea that uh, identity is a simultaneous experience. So there's no additive or separation um, of identities that these women were being discriminated against on the basis of being Black women, not on the basis of one or the other. And what this offers us intersectionality as a concept uh, is super crucial, um, that we have to see individuals as whole embodied people in context of space, place, and time. So where does that leave us? Um, with a commitment to, uh, to intersectional approaches, with intersectionality at the foundation, this leaves us with the question of how do we implement that commitment? So in sports systems, um, there's already a tension that always persists because sports systems are based on inequities. And then we try to introduce equity. So there's always a tension there. And the question then becomes, what does it mean to take an intersectional approach in this context? How can the Alliance act to fulfill the commitment of understanding persons as whole, simultaneous, simultaneous embodied beings? Another way of framing this question is instead of just telling about our commitment to intersectional approaches, how do we also show that commitment? And how do we make sure that everybody who comes in contact with the Alliance understands that this is what we, that intersectionality and intersectional approaches is what we do and what we're um, interested in? And thus, uh, the Operationalizing Intersectionality Working Group uh, was established. Um, so the inter Operationalizing Intersectionality Working Group is an internal working group at eAlliance, uh, comprised of four members, um, two of whom are volunteers from the scientific committee, and the other two are the research associates uh, staff at eAlliance. And what we were tasked with doing is coming together to kind of guide uh, the, the, to guide eAlliance um, in how to operationalize intersectionality, how to take intersectional approaches, um, what opportunities there were to act in these ways and how we could implement those. And our first task uh, was to come up with some sort of way of 
defining intersectionality and intersectional approaches so that we could share with all the wonderful people on this call and uh, researchers, sport practitioners, um, how we approach intersectionality and, in, and work together to encourage everybody to approach intersectionality and intersectional approach and, and take intersectional approaches. Uh, flip the words a little. Uh, so the four folks um, who are part of this group and who co-created like the framework that you're about to see are Dr. Janelle Joseph at University of Toronto. And I think I saw you on the call, Dr. Joseph, so a special welcome to you. Uh, thank you for, um, for coming in this afternoon. Uh, so Dr. Joseph also leads the Indigeneity, Diaspora, Equity and Anti-Racism in Sport um, or Ideas Lab at the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Amélie kaiser uh, my colleague and fellow research associate at E-Alliance based out of University of Laval, uh, who's an anthropologist. Uh, myself, uh, also a research associate at the University of Toronto. Um, I also come from the social sciences uh, or social scientific training, um, especially with regards to embodiment and health risk and how folks embody health. And Dr. Danielle Pierce, uh, who's a professor at the University of Alberta, um, who leads the Media in Motion Lab and has a number, has co founded a number of artistic and activist um, endeavors as well. And so the four of us met. Uh, for this first task a few times. We shared documents, we shared ideas, we went back and forth. And what we came up with in terms of how to express, excuse me, express how we wanted to frame operationalizing and intersectionality was, and I'm so proud to show you this, um, our framework. So this is the framework we came up with for operationalizing intersectionality. Uh, we'll walk through each element as we go, uh, but just to show you that it's a frame that is visualized as a wheel. Uh, the wheel has a center with spokes coming out of it that radiate out. Um, we have the wheel around, the circle around, that has different points of traction in which researchers and practitioners can engage. And the first question here is why the wheel? Excuse me, so the first thing to notice uh, is that a wheel, of course, is round. And as many things, uh, many models that incorporate the wheel are meant to show that this is continuous work, that there's not a beginning or an end, but it is ongoing. Um, it's something that can be cyclical uh, in, cyclical in nature. Um, sorry, someone just joined. Uh, cyclical in nature and something that uh, we can join in at different uh, points. So why else the wheel? Uh, there's some principles that we wanted to make sure we captured in this um, framework. Uh, one of them is movement, uh, that we wanted to have something that uh, was dynamic, that was changing, that was evolving, um, something that people could, um, could exert energy onto or intention and have those actions um, move this wheel um, to have movement into it. We wanted something that had the points of traction uh, because we wanted a, a model to say that if, whether, you've, whether you're new to intersectional approaches or whether you're seasoned in intersectional approaches, that you can become part of the traction and you can join in at different parts and different areas of traction uh, to start building momentum. And the exciting part about this model is, uh, one of the many I suppose, is uh, that as we build traction together with all these actions, big and small and different areas, uh, we build momentum. And so we build this momentum towards intersectional approaches, towards justice, um, towards all these really great things that we want to achieve in order to get equity. The other thing that we wanted to show was nonlinear growth. And this was certainly super important to all of us. Um, to say that intersectional approaches aren't something, uh, regrettably, aren't something that you can just kind of have a checklist and check off the boxes and say, okay, you know, I've, I've done my intersectional uh, approach for now. Um, it's a non-linear growth, uh, so you can join in at any point of traction, you can join in at any spoke, you can strengthen any part of this uh, framework and contribute to intersectional approaches and grow uh, within them and try different spaces and try um, practicing intersectional approaches in different areas. I also want to point out the arrows that uh, point in both directions and symbolizing that you can go in multiple directions with this. Uh, also to symbolize how we can move around within, in the middle, move to the outside uh, of this uh, framework uh, based if we, as we are multiply situated. 
Uh, so we can be the person in the center sometimes, we can move to harm reduction, we can move to the different points of traction based on our own situation and multiple situations. And the last thing I want to point out uh, about the wheel is the relationship to systems. So something that we all wanted to emphasize with this framework is that there are individuals in, around, and centered in it. Uh, but we wanted to really emphasize that it's about relationships to structures and systems. That it's not about someone's identity being a challenge or, um, or something to overcome, but rather that it's the systems, the overlapping systems of oppression um, that, with which we want to intervene and which we want to disrupt. Let me take you on a, a little journey through our framework. Uh, starting in the center, we have the question of who is centered. Um, and this is important to remember for three reasons, or important to be at the center of the model for three reasons. Uh, the first is that we know from Black, Indigenous, queer, critical disability studies um, that we must place more attention on folks who are the most marginalized. And by doing so, that will actually gain equity um, for all sorts of folks. And so we need to shift this emphasis and remind ourselves, always asking the question, who is centered. The second is that by centering and asking who is at the center, um, often when we ask this question, we focus on identity um, as something that we need to um, help, like someone we need to help or fix, like this is the group of people that we need to uh, help or fix. And what we wanted to instead emphasize with this model is that the, the framework demonstrates that who is at the center is impacted by the systems around them. So again, going to that idea of relationship to systems and that there are specific actions around the outside that researchers and practitioners can take um, to disrupt uh, those systems and to intervene in oppressive systems that may be impacting someone in the middle and who we're centering with work. And the last point about the question of asking who is centered is that we want to avoid um, an unspoken center. So often in research, what happens is if we use a, a kind of vague term like girls and women, for example, um, if we're not intentional and specific about who it is that we want to include. So for example, if we want to include um, identities, uh, uh, racial identities, or um, if we want to include people uh, with disabilities, then we have to be specific about that. Otherwise, we're going to end up with, for example, um, white non-disabled women and girls uh, as a stand-in if we don't specify that. So that's why we ask who is centered uh, to keep reminding us of all these things and to be conscious of who it is that we're centering uh, with our work. As we move outwards from the center, uh, we come into the spokes uh, and the spokes are supporting characteristics or the rather supporting characteristics are represented as spokes. Uh, and not that I'm a, an expert on wheels <laughs> by any means or, uh, or you know, anything that would give me, um, uh, I'm not a physicist, but um, what these spokes do uh, in the wheel is to keep uh, the, thanks, um, they keep a wheel true, uh, they keep a wheel steady. Uh, so the role of spokes is to keep a balance and a steadiness to this work. Um, as we move along. So when we say supporting characteristics represented by spokes, uh, what the supporting characteristics are, are characteristics of an individual, of a researcher, of a sport practitioner that they can strengthen and work upon um, to support uh, and to make sure that we're continually dedicated to and reminded of our commitment to intersectional approaches. And these are things that will also strengthen um, what's on the very outside, which are the points of traction. Um, so these are characteristics that we can work on individually to make sure that we keep in the direction that we want to go uh, and make sure that we stay on course and steady in our commitments. And there are things that you can see here, such as always learning, curiosity, uh, acting, transparency, connection, vulnerability. Uh, prefiguration uh, is one where the idea of prefiguration is that we are acting and living in the world in which we want to, uh, or which we want to create. So we're actively creating that world in which we want to live. Um, there are new readings involved, uh, maintaining good relations as per Anishinaabe teachings, uh, which is about maintaining relations with people uh, and living beings around us. And also challenging assumptions. So all of these characteristics 
um, are things that we want to encourage in order to keep us going on these paths. And now we come into the points of traction. Uh, so our framework has four points of traction um, that are just kind of these bigger realms of places in which people can act, uh, researchers and practitioners can act uh, to further intersectional approaches. And those four points are learning, accountability and transparency, harm reduction, and transformation. The first one, learning, uh, in no particular order, I should say, as per the nonlinear growth. Um, but learning is the idea of investing in your own learning to inform action. Excuse me. And this includes things like listening to marginalized people, scholars, activists, to reading and connecting outside your field, to join in community with marginalized people where appropriate. And the idea behind this, something I often get asked is, um, you know, I don't know XYZ people, or there aren't XYZ people, or there's only two XYZ people uh, that I know, so how do I do this? And the good news is that there's tons of resources out there um, to facilitate this learning, uh, whether it's on Instagram or, uh, or through scholarship or through uh, people, presentations, uh, learnings. And so there's lots out there to uh, learn from. And the other thing that, uh, that was offered as a, as a friendly reminder, a hint, a caveat, uh, is to make sure that we pay people. Uh, so to pay people for supporting uh, your own learning. Um, so if you are digesting these resources and these materials that people are getting paid for their labor in producing them. The second uh, point of traction is accountability and transparency. And this is about being clear about where we are in the journey and taking responsibility for the work that we have yet to do. Uh, so this includes things like being honest and transparent about decisions, exclusions, impacts, uh, apologizing in appropriate ways if and when we should, welcoming constructive criticism as a labor intensive gift so that if somebody, especially from a marginalized community is giving us feedback on something, um, to make sure that we understand that that's a, a point of, or to practice understanding that that's a point of friendship and that's a point of saying, I want to continue this relationship, but this is something that might need to change and to take it as a labor intensive gift because it does take a lot of um, energy and time to, to say things like that. And the last is in sharing findings, or not the last, but one of the other aspects is in sharing findings with participants and communities that your research will impact. So making sure that our research is always about the communities that it will impact. And there, there's two kind of overall messages uh, with accountability and transparency um, that I just want to touch on. One of them is the idea that, that I hear a, a lot from uh, folks doing this work that um, people are afraid of making mistakes. And the idea, one of the ideas in here, like with apologies and finding out when and, and if to apologize and, and uh, welcoming constructive criticism is the idea that we're going to, we're likely going to make mistakes. Uh, and it's not about being perfect, but it is about being accountable to those and trans accountable to those mistakes and transparent about what happened uh, so that we can move forward in constructive uh, ways and in listening ways. And the second bit is to, excuse me, that we wanted to emphasize um, that sometimes there can be harm done uh, when we aren't transparent about who we serve. So if we, say that we serve everybody, but that's not exactly the case, then uh, there, there's harm that comes from that. Uh, so being transparent about working towards uh, inclusion or uh, as opposed to already achieving it are things that are nuanced that are important parts of accountability and transparency. The third point of traction is in harm reduction. Uh, and this point of traction is about uh, shifting the existing systems in ways that reduce the harm. Uh, so harm reduction uh, was very thoughtfully considered um, and it comes from a, a decades long history of activism in the realm of public health and specifically in substance use and addiction. And what harm reduction does is recognize that it doesn't need to be uh, an, an all in or not, like it, it doesn't need to be a system where there's harm or no harm. Uh, that actually reducing harm within a system can be uh, and is um, a good way to uh, facilitate uh, health and to facilitate um, survival within a system. 
So in the harm reduction point of traction, uh, these are actions that acknowledge the harm caused by systems in which we are embedded and take steps to reduce the barriers and minimize inequities within those systems. Uh, so colloquially, uh, it's about making changes uh, within the system to facilitate folks' survivals. In complement, uh, we go to this last uh, point of traction, which is transformation. So in complement to harm reduction, which is working colloquially within the system to affect change, uh, transformation is about changing the system itself. So transformation is about generating deep, creative and transformative action. Um, so it changes the people involved in, in research and uh, practice, sport practicing. Um, it changes the research processes themselves and relationships with folks throughout. So this is a really, a, um, when we say transformational, it really means that people are, are changed, people and processes are changed through these um, considerations and through these points of traction. And this is about creating the just world in which we want to live. Uh, so it's about trying new methodologies and approaches that have the potential uh, to have transformative change. Now I've included here just some examples uh, from each area and melded them all together because one of the, the neat things about the wheel and the analogy of the wheel is that as it turns and as it gains momentum and builds, uh, as we build traction, gains momentum, uh, things become blurred within it. Uh, so from a prospective idea, when we were figuring out this, when we were co-creating this framework, um, there's a lot of things that come up, a lot of characteristics, a lot of ideas that come up, and it's kind of hard to parse them out sometimes, excuse me, which is great. Uh, so as we build momentum, we want all of those things to come together and we want all of them to become one whole movement towards uh, incorporating intersectional approaches. And so some of these examples uh, from all the different areas coming together are things like learning about gender identity and expression, acknowledging and naming groups or identities that aren't included in particular research projects. Uh, mentorship is a big one uh, for harm reduction. Speaking openly about systemic limitations and committing to action towards changing them. So uh, especially in this research, for example, the idea of what does gender mean and are we talking about binary genders or non-binary genders or all genders? Um, that can be very important to acknowledge uh, in your research and to commit to action towards in more in further inclusion or towards engaging more with the idea of gender. Um, to building relationships, and not only for urgencies. Um, and I was thinking about this in terms of what that uh, what not only for urgencies means, um, and the idea that because uh, we as we all move towards intersectional approaches and more towards um, making sure that we uh, include folks and especially marginalized folks in sport, um, we want to make sure that we're building relationships with the people from whom we're learning or the people who are coming in or the people that we want to connect with. And uh, so that we're not just calling, you know, at, at uh, the 12th hour and being like, hey, we need someone to tell us about, you know, how, uh, what the racialized experience of our facility is, you know, would you be able to come in? Um, so that, uh, that the way that I, I kind of thought of a fun analogy that I hope is uh, helpful for folks as well, but thinking about if you had a friend who just called you uh, only when they needed to move, so exclusively when they needed help moving, um, eventually, even if they offered you pizza afterwards, or, you know, eventually you might be like, well, this person's only calling because they want me to help them move and they want me to do this labor. Um, but if you have a relationship outside of that, uh, outside of that request, then you know, you go for coffee or whatever, you know, I don't know, walk, go for a walk with your friends, talk every now and again, um, then you can really get to connecting with each other and understanding your needs uh, and having mutual respect, which means that when these requests do come up, that they, that you know that it's going to be reciprocal, you know there's trust there, you know there's a connection there. Um, so these are the, the ways that we want to, we want to focus on building relationships uh, through all this work. Um, engaging in methodologies that are new to you, perhaps, uh, learning about the Black and Indigenous histories and treaty stories, the plans we occupy. Uh, this is something that personally I've been trying to do more of, uh, especially recently, is unlearn some of the things that I learned um, through my public school, uh, high school education in Canada, and uh, hearing the stories and histories and learning about all these um, peoples who are here uh, and how events unfolded. Uh, doing embodied research, 
uh, and situating your research paradigmatically. So all these are just examples to show, uh, you could also say citational practices, but all these are just examples to show how these areas of traction, these points of traction come together um, to start having these intersectional approaches and actions towards inclusive research. And for more examples, um, if you want to see more particular examples, more detail, uh, or if you want uh, for a description of each of the points of traction, um, the academic publication is upcoming. But meanwhile, uh, you could see our RFP 2021 companion document uh, that is online at the E-Alliance website. Um, and that has um, kind of a summary of what I've, I've said here today about the description of the different areas and also uh, how to apply this model, um, how to determine actions within it um, for inter more intersectional approaches to research and sport uh, practice. So I'll just end off here with the uses of this framework. Uh, so after going through all those pieces, uh, some of the uses that the Alliance is looking for in this are for research. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, all research produced through and with E-Alliance has these intersectional approaches uh, intertwined. Uh, one of the ways that we do that, for example, is with our most recent uh, call for proposals in which we required applicants to answer the question of how the project takes intersectional approaches, uh, which also that we include this question also requires an evaluative piece of how do we evaluate applications um, so that there is intersectionality at the forefront. Um, another thing that it does, the way to apply it is through articulation. And um, what I mean by articulation is that it, it, it's a tool that makes things talk aboutable, if you will. Um, so it shows all these different options. It shows um, different ways, different language that we can use to talk about uh, how we are going to take intersectional approaches as an organization. Uh, which also then has the effect of providing options for activities. So if you're looking for something to do to gain intersectional approaches or to, to kind of take more intersectional approaches, uh, then you can look at the different points of traction, you can look at the different characteristics or the spokes and think about, okay, what can I do in each of these? Um, or are there options that I'm not looking at? Are there options that I can uh, imagine from these? Are there options that I am doing that I'd like to keep? Um, all that sort of stuff. We're hoping that it's a tool that can help elucidate all of those options. Um, it's also in that way good for intentional decision making, documenting, and reporting. Um, so it's a way to reflect on E-Alliance activities and operations and our position uh, within the sportscape uh, and hopefully for other organizations their positions within the sportscape as well. Um, and to be intentional about what we are choosing and what we're not choosing. So this model makes it clear what sort of directions we're going and what sort of directions we're choosing not to go. Um, excuse me, as well as having those more options to decide to go for. So if we have all these options as kind of a, a menu around the wheel, uh, then we can pick and choose which ones we want to do. And then we can have language to talk about why we did or didn't um, pursue different options. And lastly, but uh, importantly, I think, um, is that this tool, this framework offers hopefully encouragement and support. Um, so I, I'm sure that uh, everyone on this call is dedicated to inclusion uh, in sport and to trying to make things better through intersectional approaches. Uh, and it's not easy work to change a system. Um, and it really does take a lot of effort from a lot of folks. It takes a lot of movement to build traction, uh, to build momentum. And so, uh, one of the things that we're hoping with this is that it builds that community of support and encouragement where we can talk to each other about these different um, approaches that we're all taking and uh, trying to work together to make that change happen uh, and to make either those first or next uh, movements towards intersectional approaches. So with that, um, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining uh, me today. It really is a pleasure to present this. Um, it's a pleasure to have worked with the Operationalizing Intersectionality Working Group on this. Um, and I can't wait to work with you all on this as well. Um, so thank you for joining us for this introduction. Um, if you have any further questions, comments, or concerns, please feel welcome to connect as always at info at ealliance.ca. Uh, and as we said, a recording of this session will be available online shortly. Um, so thank you very much.